I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life living in Latin America. A lot of people, when you're looking to move abroad or you start doing any research about travel or anything like that, you're going to be bombarded with people who are trying to sell you on the idea that you need to build a passport portfolio. What exactly does that mean? Does it apply to you? Is it actually what it's hyped up to be? We're going to talk about all of that right after the bump. Recently, on Ron's Nearshore Living, he did an episode on passport portfolios and why these are potentially dangerous and counterproductive. His basic premise is that the number one thing that protects you, and most people who are looking at passport portfolios are doing so because they're looking for some kind of protection, is by being wealthy. The more money you have access to, whether you can show it off or get access to it, actually spend it, or whatever, the more you have, the more safety you have. And having extra passports really doesn't mean mean very much. People who have lots of passports often already have a lot of money, and so we see a, t a tendency of people with lots of passports to have a bit of protection, and it's easy for people who feel that having lots of money is unobtainable, that having lots of passports probably is obtainable, or at least that's the dream that they are sold, and so they are likely to fall for that because it fills an emotional goal. They know that simply being rich isn't something that they can just go do and you would never be able to just take a seminar that's like how to be rich, go do that and make lots of money. Of course, people do fall for that on a regular basis, but they know that things like how to get lots of passports is something you can easily take a class on and it feels like something someone could teach you and that maybe that would have value since why would they teach it if it didn't have value? But of course, they're teaching it because it has value to them, not because it has value to you. The whole reason that people push passport portfolios is because there's an entire industry in trying to get people to get them and either offering services advising on it or services obtaining it. And some people actually do get many passports, but very rarely do people talk about whether it's actually beneficial. They'll list lots of benefits, but rarely do those benefits actually make very much sense or play out likely in a real world scenario. And of course, almost no one ever goes through a real world scenario. So people are left simply assuming that people who have lots of passports are telling the truth that they feel protected and maybe they do feel that way but the reality is often quite different the idea behind having many passports is that in theory the benefits of passports are cumulative you can have one passport that lets you get in very easily to algeria and another passport that lets you get in very easily to colombia and another one that lets you get in very easily to the philippines and as you accumulate passports you'll be able to go anywhere you want stay anywhere you want live anywhere you want pay the taxes wherever you want and it sounds great you get the benefits of all these different places you can mix and match to your heart's content the reality is that is not how passports work. To some degree, you would get some accumulated benefits. If your passport from the United States made it easy to travel to Mexico, for example, that would be something that you would keep. If you then added a passport from another part of the world, let's say Colombia, that may make it super easy to go into Brazil. I'm just assuming that that is the case. So having those two passports would make for that specific advantage reasonable. But there are also negatives that come with these, and sometimes pretty big ones. So in this example, if you have a Colombian passport, I don't believe that you have any tax liabilities when living abroad. If you decide to live in Nicaragua, for example, Colombia doesn't really care. They don't track your money. They're not going to tax you as long as you're earning your money outside of Colombia. If you're from the United States, however, and you have, uh, if you have an American passport, which is what being from means in this case, then no matter where you're living and no matter what you're doing, you have to file your taxes with the United States. Now, if you have multiple countries like the United States and they all require that you file your taxes, you can get into a situation where you're filing many taxes per year. Let's say you have five passports and they all end up being this way. That'd be super extreme. You have to file your taxes five times, and if all of them consider all of your money to be taxable worldwide, you could end up being taxed far above the amount of money you earn. For every dollar you earn, you owe more in taxes than you're earning. And you can say, but I'm being taxed by these other entities, and those entities are going to say, that's not our problem. You're the person who got all these passports and opted into all these tax systems. Not our problem. Now, some countries look at what you pay in taxes in other countries, and they allow that to be taken off of what you owe, so it's very rare that you would end up in a scenario where 
where you couldn't make your payments at all, but you could very easily end up in a scenario where you have limitations as to where you're allowed to travel, where you're able to pay taxes and all that. And one of the great examples is while the U.S. gives you a passport that allows you to go to most countries, it forbids you to go to certain countries. It makes it that you're not allowed to be stamped into Cuba, for example, or you're not allowed to be stamped into North Korea in most circumstances. So that's a, it, even if you got a passport from another country, sure, it'd be very difficult for the United States to find out that you went into one of those countries, but you're still subject to the fact that as an American passport holder, you're not allowed to be in that country. So there are negatives that also accumulate with all of the passports. And that's something that people forget a lot, or they forget that the negatives that they are used to, oh, I have to pay taxes in the United States as an American. If I go get a passport from Panama, that'll alleviate that. No, it will not. I may not have to pay any additional taxes in Panama. I don't know. I haven't checked. But I certainly don't have to pay extra taxes in the U.S. because of that, but I do have to pay the same ones I always had to pay. I don't get out of anything. So that's super important to understand that you may be accumulating some benefits, but you may be accumulating some negatives. And in most cases, those benefits are not very big. Yes, having two passports has a certain amount of advantage if they're both good ones, but as you get more and more, they become very quickly less and less desirable and very quickly more and more dangerous. And just because you have a passport today and they say, oh yeah, no, it's you have no taxes, you know, that can change in the future. And because you are a citizen of that country, they have claim to you worldwide. Getting a passport is kind of like selling your soul to a new country. Not quite that bad, right? It's people who are born there already have their soul sold to that country. So it's a weird system some human politics and all that. So I totally understand why when you break it down, it feels awfully strange. Sure. But if you go and, and you're an American and you want to add Mexico as a citizenship, you are giving yourself to the country of Mexico and making yourself equally a Mexican along with anything else that you are. So if they decide they want to call you up for military service, they have that right. Now, you can say, well, but my country says that they can't. Yes, but your country has no say when they're doing that. You could end up breaking the law and you can end up in a situation where what's illegal in one country is a requirement in another. It is physically possible to end up in a situation where you have no means of not breaking the law. I've never actually known anyone to have a story of that ever really coming up, but those kinds of fringe cases are possible. And again, in most cases, they look the other way or it's impossible to track you. And so you're able to get away with it from that perspective. But that means that your idea that having many passports protects you isn't really the case. It gives you more to hide from as well. Now, it is true that by having a passport in a country, you generally assume that that citizenship is going to allow you to live in that country no matter what. That is the international expectation of countries. So unlike residency, where having residency in many countries that you're not actually living in does not carry any real benefits, no matter what it emotionally feels like, having a certain number of passports does convey some benefits. If I have an American passport and a Nicaraguan passport, for example, which I do not have, but if I was to get it, it would give me an extra level of comfort. With my residency, they have the option of declining to renew my residency or to cancel my residency. That is completely within the right of the government to do. If I have my citizenship, I am a full citizen of the country. There are specific laws that do allow citizenship to be rescinded in most countries under very specific conditions, but it's way harder to do and it requires you to not fall into a stateless category and all kinds of things. So it's a lot more complicated uh, than it is with residency. Residency is ephemeral and citizenship is very, very firm and and, and, and structured. So it is, it is uh, true that if you have a few really good solid citizenships that you may have some kind of protection, but let's talk about what that is protecting against because that's an important consideration. It sounds good. Oh, we're protected, but protected against what exactly? Are you protected against fire or flood? No, it's not like an insurance plan. We're talking about you're protected that you have the right to reside in a given country at a moment's notice without any other permission. It's a very specific thing. Nice, of course, but it's a very specific thing. So the first thing to ask is what kind of event is going to happen that makes someone have to move to a new country, have to be relocated and that they, they're not able to use their existing residency or, or just tourist visas to get where they need to go. Generally, we're assuming things like massive medical uh, pandemic outbreaks. We're talking about zombie apocalypse. We're talking about collapse of the world order. We're talking about alien invasion, meteor strikes, really, really dramatic things that we've never actually experienced as humans. Generally, if it's anything less than those types of events, which are completely possible, and I understand we may have gone through meteor strikes in the past, but not since we know how it actually played out, uh, without 
those kinds of things, it's really kind of moot having lots of uh, passports doesn't do that much for you because let's say you're living in the United States and you decide you want to move to Mexico. Well, generally you're able to move to Mexico just as easy or nearly as easy coming from the United States immediately uh, than having a Mexican passport ahead of time, being a citizen ahead of time. Sure, it's nice to know that the paperwork is done. It's nice to have it in hand. But and if you are able to get that super easily, then by all means, I'm not trying to tell you not to have another passport if the opportunity is available to you. But be realistic that there's a difference between taking advantage of an easy opportunity that is presented to you and going through a difficult process process of intentionally selecting to be a passport portfolio person and trying to come up with an excuse to get lots of passports. Because let's be fair, getting a passport is generally a time-consuming and expensive process. It may not be tens of thousands of dollars, but generally it is. And it may not be months of work, but generally it's years. So in most cases, especially passports that you actually want, you're looking at some massive outlay of money or time and quite often both. And so you have to really weigh what benefit are you expecting to get from having a passport in a place you're not looking to already be a full-time living citizen versus just being well-prepared with financial resources to go wherever makes sense in the event of a major disaster. Because in all those cases that we gave examples of, one of the things we don't know is which places are going to be safe and which places are going to be overrun by zombies. We just don't know. We can make some educated guesses, but we don't know. This has never happened before. So there's going to be all kinds of unknown. When that happens, you're going to be at, in the moment making really wild decisions. Well, we heard that Paraguay has not been overrun by zombies. We're going to go there. How are you going to get there? Well, we're just going to fly into the jungle. We know a guy, right? That's what you're talking about. The fact that you have a passport to Paraguay may not matter. They may not have a functional government at that point. The fact that you have a passport may not matter because there's no border to go through. It may not matter because you're flying into the jungle and getting dropped off and you're already there. And they're going to take pity on you anyway because they can't get rid of any survivors because they need them to hold off the dead. Right? All these things. Like it, it, There's just not this logic to having the passport ahead of time. If you're you know, having a scenario where you need a passport and none of these big things have happened, what good is the passport really doing for you in most cases? So yes, again, there are very specific cases where you want access to a specific country or you want to be able to stay indefinitely and it's really easy to get the passport or whatever. Yes, a specific place that you truly want to live, that you really want to take care of a specific tax regime or whatever that affects you and you're able to leverage it. Of course, you want to get the passports that make sense to you, but having a collection of them really does not normally do that. All the reasons that people are given, all this protecting against the future, avoiding panic. These are all emotional pleas for something that if you were thinking logically, if you didn't have that emotional response, you'd say, what possible good does this actually do me? It sounds neat to have an extra passport, but it doesn't actually do any real specific thing. I live here in Nicaragua. If I was to have a passport here, which, sure, I would appreciate getting a passport. I'm not saying I don't want one, but if I was to have a passport here, I then have to carry two passports pretty much anytime I go anywhere. Because if I'm moving in or out of Nicaragua, I have to have my Nicaragua passport with me. So I can never be outside Nicaragua without it because I have to have it to get home. But if I'm going to travel anywhere that happens across through the United States or have any chance that I might have to pass through the United States, I have to carry my United States passport. So I'm forced to carry two passports. That's not the end of the world, but it is is annoying that now I'm carrying two passports. Imagine if I also had citizenship in, you know, Mexico or something, and it's in Panama. I could be forced to carry four passports all the time. Pretty soon, it's really annoying to have those in my pocket every time I go anywhere. So that gets a little bit complicated. And you have to remember which border you're going through and use the right one. If you use the wrong one at Nicaragua, it counts as voluntarily rescinding your citizenship. So you could end up accidentally losing your citizenship because you got confused and weren't paying attention. So don't do that, right? Like this is, there's just a lot of complications when you start having extra passports. So you need to have a reason why you really want to have it. Now, because Nicaragua is my home, it's a little bit different. If you have moved to a new place, you've gotten your residency, you're putting in the time, you're sure that that is the place you're going to be long term. And right now, my residency is a five year before I renew it. At the end of that five years, I think I have to renew again. At the end of that 10 years, I'm in a position to potentially have a reasonable discussion with the government about maybe citizenship being something that I could maybe pursue. Maybe. It's a strategy. I don't know, right? I know very few people who've ever done it, very few stories of anyone who's ever done it, but it exists, right? And, and as someone who is raising my children here, someone who has, you know, completely invested in the country, yes, it might make sense for me. I have no plans on returning to the country that I originally came from, and I have no plans or expectations that I'm going to be moving on to another country in any what, what 
any any reasonable way. I may travel a lot. I sure hope that I do. I want to see the world. I love doing that, but I want Nicaragua to be my home base from which I do that. That could change in the future, of course, but I don't anticipate that changing. We love it here, and we've put in a lot of time making that decision really certainly, but it's going to be at least five more years, if not a much more likely 10 years, before we have to make any further decisions about it. It's just riding out the residency that we have now. So during that time period, we can put in really good thought processes around it. And if this is truly the country that we're going to be in for forever, then yes, having a passport from here would be awfully convenient. It would be nice to be able to be buried and recognized as a member of the Nicaraguan community in every possible way when I finally pass on. My children, I expect to keep living in Nicaragua, and it would be nice for them to see us as actually being Nicaraguans and not just, you know, foreigners who live a long time in Nicaragua. Those are important things, and they're they're kind of mental. Uh, so it's, it's an emotional thing for sure, and I totally understand that. But there is value to it, and it does give us the slightest amount of more security, and it is easier. We don't have to renew our paperwork every five years. We don't have to reprint our cedulas. Those things do get a little bit easier. So there are actual tangible benefits, but they are very minor in general unless we're traveling to a country that the U.S. is not allowed in and Nicaragua is, it's basically a break even in the logistics of life. It is more about being identified as real Nicaraguans. I would love to carry a Nicaraguan passport and when people look at it say, oh, oh I didn't, I, I, oh, I completely misread, you are actually Nicaraguan. That would be cool. So there's reasons but they aren't reasons of protecting me in some way. If Nicaragua wants me here, they're going to keep me here and keep me safe. So that is that is just how it works. And if I need to move on somewhere else, I can choose where it's going to make sense at the time because those things you can't really decide ahead of time. The big picture is that passport portfolios sound amazing. How could they be bad? But easily they are bad. It is rare that they're actually going to have a potential benefit. It is really common for people to whip out a portfolio of passports and you say, what does any of these give you ever in your life? And they're unclear. But more importantly, I've never heard of anyone ever being able to leverage having a passport portfolio. Now, of course, we're basing that based on a lot of the, the push for these portfolios is that the world is going to end. And it's just this unbelievable level of tragedy beyond anything in the human experience. So we're able to promote fear and uncertainty and doubt and panic and this whole feeling of you can't predict what's going to happen. Okay, sure. But when you get to that point, I say this a lot, all bets are off putting in a bunch of money and time to getting your passport portfolio just to find out that the borders fall, the governments fall, and the whole world order collapses, and none of this matters anyway. Because if people aren't honoring passports in the future, then what was the point in having one other than being able to say, remember in the old world 50 years ago, I was, you know, on paper a part of Panama. Nobody cares. No one's ever going to care. The world has fallen apart. Money is worthless, and zombies are in control. So you have to really look logically at the big picture and say, all this time and money are unlikely to seriously protect you against anything in the real world and even less against these theoretical world-ending disasters that you get this emotional feeling that you can't predict what's going to happen, but that's exactly why this is a bad idea. The one thing we can predict here is that a passport is less likely to be viable and useful and protective in the future that something dramatic happens than having the money that you spent on the portfolio and the time that you spent on the portfolio having more resources to protect yourself when the time comes. Think of it in that perspective. Everything has a trade-off, and in this case, the thing you're trading off is safety and, and wealth. If you don't ever need to use that for safety, then that's wealth you can use. But if you put that into passports, it is gone. Once you've made that step, it's evaporated. And you then have this ongoing risk that those countries may decide that they have, they're going to tax you, or you're going to be called up for military service, or you're not allowed to leave their country, or that they're going to you know, uh, uh, rescind your citizenship if you don't move to their country. Any number of things. They, they are sovereign nations. They have the right to do that. And so it's important to remember these things, that these protections we assume are just assumptions. They're not the reality. They're not how it works in practice. So uh, I want you to really deeply step back and say, is this something I'm interested in from an emotional perspective? Or is this something that I'm interested in from a risk assessment perspective? Can I identify exactly why I would spend time and money on something like this? What is my tangible, real world 
actual benefit going to be from it? And if you can find that, if it's going to be, well, with a Swiss passport, I'm going to be able to travel anywhere I want in the world, anytime that I want. I can stay in Switzerland indefinitely. I can get lower taxes. It's going to make my life really wonderful, and I can start up businesses there that I want to do, and you need to have citizenship to be sure that you're able to stay in Switzerland for forever. Absolutely, go get your Swiss citizenship. If you can really define what the benefits are, then you're good to go. But if you're doing it because someone has told you it's the hip new thing, or someone has told you that there's something to be scared of and you need to protect yourself, then you're being conned. And it's a very, very common con because expats or people looking to become expats are often doing so under frustration or fear and preying on that, especially people who are nearing retirement, have a lot of uncertainty and people are tr always right in the news trying to make the world sound a lot scarier than it actually is because that's what sells news cycles. And so with that, it's just scarier and scarier and scarier than it actually is. The world is a scary place. Don't get me wrong, but it is not as scary. The world is not collapsing in the way that people are trying to sell you. That's how they make their money. And so take a moment and say, wait, this is a standard expat scam. I don't have to do this, but what I should be doing is evaluating where I should be. I should be looking at becoming an expat. I should be looking at very tangible things I can do to make my life better, to protect myself, to protect my family, things that make sense. Actually living somewhere can make a big difference but just having the paperwork that in theory would have let you live somewhere, but probably isn't going to apply when disaster is actually struck is not going to make sense. So save your money, save your time, use it on something that's going to actually protect you. Invest that, spend it on a house, spend it on moving, do something to actually action improving your life and protecting you from everything going on in the world as best as you can. For us, that's Nicaragua. We feel that Nicaragua shields us from so many of the things that people worry about. We really don't worry about any of those things. The dollar collapsing, which is completely unrealistic, but even if it did, we don't care. It doesn't make any difference at all. D what if the US economy collapses? We don't care. It makes no difference at all. What if war breaks out? I feel terrible for the people who are caught in that war, but it won't break out here makes no difference to us in a personal basis, right? We still feel terrible for anybody who's stuck living in a wartime situation. But all these things, our first job is to protect ourselves and most importantly, our families and my dogs who are standing here at my feet because there's a storm going on. And then we do our best to protect the world. But you're going to also, in many cases, do your best to protect the world by voting with your residency. We had an episode where we talked about that. And Nicaragua was a great example where they take uh, foreign relations and, and their place on the world stage very, very uh, uh, seriously. And they, they look to be a good player worldwide. And being here is something that you can actually feel good about, that your presence in the country is not contributing to a loud voice of bad behavior, but instead contributing to a voice shouting, trying to protect those that can't protect themselves. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. I'll put the link up above. And of course, if you'd like to join our channel, that would be fantastic. We've got a join button right down there. And we love it when you guys leave comments down below, or even better, if you make a video and send it in, I'd love to put you guys on the show and let you actually be seen here. I'm hoping to get this out on Friday. So if you see this, hopefully we have a live stream coming up today. It's normally on Thursdays. I'm very good about that, but I had a funeral on Wednesday and Thursday, one funeral two days. Uh, so, um, we're doing today is my plan is to get the uh, <clears throat> the the live stream done and tomorrow is our reopening party at Desperados in Las Pinitas in the Leon area out on the beach. Uh, it is 100 cord three dollars uh, to enter and it is 200 cord or six dollars to take the bus from the city. Uh, I will do my best to get the link to those things uh, in the show notes. And so if you can watch the live stream today, that'd be fantastic. If you're in the area and can come out to Desperados for the party tomorrow, that would be amazing. I will be there along with a lot of other people and. Uh, I will see all of you tomorrow.